The management of ovarian cysts in postmenopausal women. Green Top Guideline Number 34, July 2016. Introduction and Background Epidemiology. Ovarian cysts are common in postmenopausal women. The exact prevalence is unknown given the limited amount of published data and the lack of established screening programs for ovarian cancer. However, Studies have estimated the incidence to be anywhere between 5% and 17%. The greater use of ultrasound in gynecological practice and the widespread generalized use of other imaging techniques such as computed tomography, CT, and magnetic resonance imaging or MRI mean that an increasing proportion of the cysts will be found incidentally. However, Cystic lesions in the postmenopausal ovary should only be reported as ovarian cysts and considered significant if they are 1 cm or more in size. Cystic lesions smaller than 1 cm are clinically inconsequential and it is at the discretion of the reporting clinician whether or not to describe them in the imaging report as they do not need follow-up. The vast majority of these identified cysts are benign. Therefore, the underlying management rationale is to distinguish between those cysts that are benign and those that are potentially malignant. Diagnosis and significance of ovarian cysts in postmenopausal women. How are ovarian cysts diagnosed in postmenopausal women? and what initial investigations should be performed. Clinicians should be aware of the different presentations and significance of ovarian cysts in postmenopausal women. In postmenopausal women presenting with acute abdominal pain, the diagnosis of an ovarian cyst accident should be considered, for example, torsion, rupture, and hemorrhage. It is recommended that ovarian cysts in postmenopausal women should be initially assessed by measuring serum cancer antigen 125 or CA125 level and transvaginal ultrasound scan. Ovarian cysts in postmenopausal women could present in one of three ways. Some women present with acute pain, for example, torsion or rupture of a cyst, requiring immediate evaluation. Other women have their ovarian cysts identified during gynecological investigations, for example, for postmenopausal bleeding. Finally, some ovarian cysts are found incidentally in postmenopausal women undergoing investigations by other specialties for non gynecological conditions, for example, cross sectional imaging for general surgical or medical indications. In order to triage women and guide further management, an estimate needs to be made as to the risk that the ovarian cyst is malignant. At present, the recommended tests are serum CA125 measurement and pelvic ultrasound. The anxiety and concerns for the possibility of ovarian cancer and the women's understandable fear of malignancy should not be underestimated. The rationale behind and the limitations of any recommended test should be clearly and sensitively communicated to the women with an explanation of the results. Where the initial imaging modality was a CT scan, unless this clearly indicated ovarian malignancy and widespread intra-abdominal disease, an ultrasound scan should be obtained in order to calculate the risk of malignancy index or RMI. What is the role of history and clinical examination in postmenopausal women with ovarian cysts? A thorough medical history should be taken from the women with specific attention to risk factors and symptoms suggestive of ovarian malignancy and a family history of ovarian, bowel, or breast cancer. Where family history is significant, Referral to the Regional Cancer Genetics Service should be considered. Appropriate tests should be carried out in any postmenopausal woman who has developed symptoms 
within the last 12 months that suggests irritable bowel syndrome, particularly in women over 50 years of age or those with a significant family history of ovarian, bowel, or breast cancer. A full physical examination of the woman is essential and should include a body mass index or BMI, abdominal examination to detect ascites, and characterize any palpable mass and vaginal examination. Family history can be used to define women who are at increased risk of ovarian cancer. A woman is defined as being at high risk of ovarian cancer if she has a first-degree relative like mother, father, sister, brother, daughter, or son affected by cancer within a family with two or more individuals with ovarian cancer who are first-degree relatives of each other, one individual with ovarian cancer at any age, and one with breast cancer diagnosed under age 50 years who are first-degree relatives of each other, one relative with ovarian cancer at any age, and two with breast cancer diagnosed under age 60 years who are connected by first-degree relationships, three or more family members with colon cancer, or two with colon cancer, and one with stomach, ovarian, endometrial, urinary tract, or small bowel cancer in two generations. One of these cancers must be diagnosed under age 50 years, and affected relatives should be first-degree relatives of each other. One individual with both breast and ovarian cancer. A woman is also considered at increased risk of ovarian cancer if she is a known carrier of relevant cancer gene mutations, for example, BRCA1, BRCA2, and mismatch repair genes. She is an untested first-degree relative of an individual with a relevant cancer gene mutation, or she is an untested second-degree relative through an unaffected man of an individual with a relevant cancer gene mutation. Where family history is significant, referring the woman to the Regional Cancer Genetics Service should be considered. Ovarian cancer often presents with vague abdominal symptoms that are widely experienced among the general population. Persistent abdominal distension, feeling full and or loss of appetite, pelvic or abdominal pain, increased urinary urgency, and or frequency. Therefore, the challenge is to make the correct diagnosis as early as possible, despite the non-specific nature of symptoms and signs, and various indices have been developed to triage women for further investigations and correlate symptoms to the likelihood of ovarian cancer, for example, the GOF symptom index. The symptoms described have greater significance in postmenopausal women, particularly over 50 years of age, if experienced persistently or on a frequent basis, or in those with a significant family history, two or more cases of ovarian or breast cancer diagnosed at an early age in first-degree relatives. Although clinical examination has poor sensitivity in the detection of ovarian masses, 15 to 51 percent, its importance lies in the evaluation of any palpable mass for tenderness, mobility, nodularity, and ascites. Pelvic examinations, including a rectal exam, even under anesthesia, have shown limited ability to identify an adnexal mass especially with increasing patient body mass index greater than 30. Nevertheless, features most consistently associated with an adnexal malignancy include a mass that is irregular, has a solid consistency, is fixed, nodular, or bilateral, or is associated with ascites. Postmenopausal women should be urgently referred to specialist services if physical examination identifies ascites and or a pelvic or abdominal mass. What blood tests should be performed in postmenopausal women with ovarian cysts? 
CA125. CA125 should be the only serum tumor marker used for primary evaluation as it allows the RMI or Risk of Malignancy Index of ovarian cysts in postmenopausal women to be calculated. CA125 levels should not be used in isolation to determine if a cyst is malignant. While a very high value may assist in reaching the diagnosis, a normal value does not exclude ovarian cancer due to the non-specific nature of the test. The use of serum CA125 is well established, being raised in over 80% of epithelial ovarian cancer cases, but not in most primary mucinous ovarian cancers. If a cutoff of 30 international unit per ml is used, the test has a sensitivity of 81% and a specificity of 75%. However, CA125 values can show wide variation with lower levels, equivalent to 20 international unit per ml, found in healthy postmenopausal women. Non-malignant gynecological conditions such as pelvic inflammatory disease, fibroids, acute events in benign cysts, for example torsion or hemorrhage, and endometriosis can all result in an increased CA125 level. Higher values are reported in Caucasian compared with African or Asian women. Caffeine intake, hysterectomy, and smoking have been associated with lower CA125 levels in some reports. Numerous benign non-gynecological conditions that cause peritoneal irritation, such as tuberculosis, cirrhosis, ascites, hepatitis, pancreatitis, peritonitis, and pleuritis, and other primary tumors that metastasize to the peritoneum, such as breast, pancreas, lung, and colon cancer can also cause an elevated CA125. CA125 alone has a pooled sensitivity and a specificity of 78% for differentiating benign from malignant abnexal masses with higher values noted in postmenopausal women.